Today we're going to be talking about an interesting topic. We're starting a new series. It's called Sex. Sex, sex, sex. Uh, yes, I know I mentioned sex, and you're going to hear me say that word several more times today, maybe up, up to a hundred times. Um, so you're going to get your year full of the word sex. But I know that that word sex, before now, for some of us, it emotes certain kinds of feelings, right? You hear the word sex and you react to it differently. Sometimes you get a distaste in your mouth, in your mind, like, you know, I, I don't want to talk about that. For some of us, it just, it just drives us wild. Oh, yeah, what about sex, you know? Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to seek God's heart and seek to find what God is saying concerning sex. It's a very sensitive topic. It's a sen topic that sometimes, you know, is over-sensationalized. Sometimes it's, it's avoided. And we want to seek the balance, a healthy balance, and find what God's heart is about sex. You cannot watch TV. You cannot do anything without seeing sexual innuendos. Um, people, some people, the only language they know how to talk is sex. That's all they talk about, right? And you can see that sex controls their very existence. It, it, it controls everything, the way they think, the way they process information, everything. That's unhealthy. On the other hand, we see that some people don't want to talk about it. They want to avoid it, but yet they still do it, you know? Um, so <laughs> so let's, just, let's just say, you know what, Holy Spirit, why don't you tell us what you want us to know about sex? That's our goal, to say, God, just help us see your heart concerning this thing that you have created. And a good place to start is to really go back to the person who designed sex. Go back to God. What is God's heart for sex? God de de designed it. He designed it for a reason. Let us see if we can get an idea of why God created sex in the first place. So the first thing to know is that God transcends sex. God is not affected or moved by sex. God is a spirit being. It's an all-powerful being, all-sovereign being. It's wonderful, powerful. It is just too big. We do not serve a God that is moved by sex like the Greek God. We do not serve the God of fertility or, or, the, or the God that is, you know, all of the different gods of the world. We serve a God that is outside of that. So our God is not moved and touched in the same way as other gods are when it comes to this matter of sex. So I want us, first of all, to understand that God is outside of this creation that he created, and he created it for a purpose, and we need to ask God to seek God's heart concerning what he has created. But we see in scripture that scripture references God as the groom and the church as his bride. In the New Testament, we see that. In the Old Testament, we see God being the groom and the nation of Israel being his bride. We see God speaking in this language and talking to his people and saying, you've broken my heart again. And now you all around, sleeping around, using those, those phrases and those, those you know, figurative expressions to express to, to people that they love how his heart is broken, that they are not faithful towards him. The use of sex in, in, in that construct by God in Scripture is not to say that we serve a sexual God or a God that, that is longings for sex or something like that. It's saying that, hey, my heart, the only way you would understand, the language that you would understand, for some of us, the, the only time we are aware of anything is when our, sex, when our sexuality is involved, when, our, when we have the urge and all of that. We are paying attention to everything. I mean, we are like at a hundred. God is saying that same feeling you feel, that longing that you feel, that, that thing, that thirst, that thing that you feel, that's how I feel towards you spiritually. And so it's a figurative expression to help us understand God's depth of love and God's search for our heart. It's critical because it's, it's something that we all have to unravel. After we've unraveled what Sex means from God's perspective. This is one of the things that we take away as to what it points towards God, how it helps us begin to understand God's love concerning us, that God will use that expression to express his love concerning us. That is why he would tell his prophet, hey, you know what? To show the nation of Israel what I mean, I want you to go get married to an harlot. I want you to go marry somebody who is a prostitute, right? And then bring her to your house. God is helping you understand how sensitive this is. For men, most of us, well, let me know, most of us, men, no matter how crazy you've been in the world, you don't want nobody touching your wife. Am I, am I, am I right about that? It don't matter what you do out there. You don't want nobody touching your wife. God is saying, now you, my prophet, go get a prostitute. 
I want to show to people what, how this breaks my heart. So our sexuality and our journey in our sexuality sometimes help us really understand God's heart concerning us. And today I'm not going to tell you what to do or what not to do or whatever. My goal is to just paint a picture of what sex is. Help us see sex from God's perspective. And later on we can talk about when to have sex, who, who, who has sex, and all of that. But today I want to just change the paradigm. I want us to just lay aside the concepts that we've had, the preconceptions that we've had, the immediate reactions when we hear that word sex, the image that comes to mind. For some of us it's a traumatic image because that's how we got introduced to sex. For some of us, it is a pleasant one, but now our heart is broken. For some of us, it brings feelings of shame and pain and all of that. I just want us to lay all of that aside and just say, God, what is your perspective about this topic? What do you have to tell us about sex? And then we can move on from there. So God created a diversity of beings. God created man and woman. He created sexes, male and female. And then he created sex as a, as a tool, as a mechanism, as a magical experience to kind of bring this man and woman together in unity, to co-join, to, to experience a deeper level of awareness of one another, a deeper level of connection that nothing else can give you except that mechanism that God created. And so God was intentional when he did it. So sex, to start with, is a gift. Sex is a gift. And I know that for some of us, when I say sex is a gift, what comes to mind is it's a terrible gift. Yes, but sex right now, God is going to help reframe our mindset. Sex is a gift from God. Sex is not coincidental. It is not accidental. It didn't happen by chance. Sex is architecture. It's planned. It's designed by your maker. He planned it for a purpose. So sex is a gift that God gives to us. We see in Genesis, Scripture says that everything God created was good. Everything God created was good. In fact, the only thing that God saw in Genesis that was not good was that man was only. Man lonely. Man was by himself. What do you see about that picture? Man couldn't have sex. So God looked at man, said, bro, you, you, you lonely, bro. We got to do something about this. We, we got to do something about this. This is not good. This is not good. We, we, we got we to we do something about this, Adam. We got to do something about this. So God looked at everything he created, and he said, this is good. This is good. This is good. And when he looked at Adam, he says, yo, it's not good for you to be by yourself. And I know that, you know, when we over-spiritualize these things, we read scriptures, and the first thing that comes to mind is, oh, Adam needed somebody to make breakfast for him. No. Adam, need, Adam didn't need nobody to make laundry for him. They, weren't, they, didn't, they didn't have no clothes. They had abundance of food. Everything was copacetic. There was no... The reality of what wives do for husbands today, half of it, Eve did not do for Adam before the fall. So tell me what the help was. Tell me what the help was. God said, Adam, you need help. You need some help in your life, and I'm going to arrange that help for you. But tell me what the help is. And so we got to be frank. You know, we, we got to be open about this, this matters. We, we got to say, God, what did you mean about help? I know it has to do with emotional balance, emotional support. I know it has to do with spiritual support so that they can both serve God. I understand that. But I also know that it has to do with sexual fulfillment. Somebody say amen in the church. So part of God's plan, the gift, was to create a system where Adam and Eve could be fulfilled with one another. They could help each other out. Only married people need help, God. Single people, you don't need that kind of help. Jesus is your help. He is your helper. Somebody say amen. amen. Everything God created was perfect. Imagine this. The world was not perfect without sex. It doesn't look like that, right? 
our understanding now is the sex is a problem in the world. Isn't it? We look around like it's just too much problem, right, because of this matter of sex. The world was not perfect without sex. So the problem is not sex. It's problem is what we have done with sex. Holy Spirit, help us. Help me, help me. So man needed a helper. Scripture says, I will make him a helper fit for him. So God created man and woman. He created the sexes, and he gave, gave them this gift of sex so that mankind can find fulfillment in, one, in each other, male and female. So sex is intentional. It's God's plan, and it has specific functions. There is a reason or reasons why God created sex. And you have to know those reasons. And today we're going to look at some of these benefits, some of the reasons why God created sex. So that we can, when we start thinking about sex, before you even think about whether or not you should have sex, when you see sex, you understand what sex is meant for from God's perspective. From God's perspective. So sex is a gift. Everybody needs to understand that it's a gift of God to us. It's a gift that you receive when you get married. You know, some gifts, you, 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 it's, it's based on time. I got my, my kids, you know, they, we're talking about, okay, what kind of car are they going to drive when they get to 17 or 18 when they start driving? I said, I'm going to go get you a $2,000 car. <laughs> a car that you can hear the engine drive when you hear the noise. You know, it's time for you to change oil. <laughs> oil change. You know, you teach you some lessons. So there are some gifts that you tie to time period. Sex is a gift, but it's not one that you unwrap before you marry. It's a gift that is scheduled for a particular time of your life. And you get it within marriage. You open that gift on your marriage day, on the day you get married, marriage day. That's when you open that gift. So I want us to begin to reframe what our ideas of sex is. Now, sex is also intimate. Sex is intimate. Sex is intimate. We're seeing too much. It's just too much. We need to begin to understand that sex is intimate. And for us, I think for a lot of us, yeah, it's not a problem. But the world today is just, it's, we have experiencing deviations from God's word. You know, everybody wants to show up and show out and show everything out. But sex, your sexuality, your body it should be an intimate thing. Your sex, sexual experience should be intimate. The only person who should be able to see you, and the, the, the word is, uh, um, intimacy, I like the way it sounds when it's pronounced in the dictionary, it's into, into, me, into me you see. It's not into me you see, into me see, which means into me you see. I, I heard somebody say that, and I, I, it just stuck with me since I heard them say that. And it, it just gives an impression that when, when you have sex with somebody, they see your innermost part. They see who you really are. There's nothing about you again. That it's not just your body they see. Like they see through you. It's not just your body they see through you. They see inside of you. And the only person we should have that level of access to your body, the only person we should have access to anything outside of your clothing, beyond your clothing, under your clothing, should be the person that you are intimately connected to. To the person who you are connected to intimately first at heart. So the person should know your heart, fully know the person you are before they even discover your body. I know the world has flipped it the other way. Now people discover everything there is to discover about your body before they get to know who you really are. But that's not the way God designed it. The person has to know you first, externally, know your heart before they have access to your body. So sex is intimate. It is a co-joining, it's an activity between two people that they have privately, in covenant, discreetly, um, sacredly. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a beautiful thing, but it ought to be intimate, intimate expression of love between two people. And sex also leads to full knowledge, full disclosure. If you have sex with somebody, you've given them full disclosure of your life. I mean, full disclosure. Knowledge is not just cognitive, but always experiential and deeply personal. And sexual intercourse is never just physiological,
but always involves mystery. And it touches the whole person. Your entire being is involved when you have sex. And sometimes we don't teach this enough. People don't even know. They're just thinking, you know, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to cool off. I'm just trying to have a good time. No, you are connecting yourself in multiple layers with somebody else, physiologically, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. If some of you have got some bad habits that you, you just don't know where it came from, you got connected with somebody who got a strong, strong spirit of... It's, it's how powerful it is. It connects you deeply on the soul level with whoever you're connected with sexually. Now, sex is also productive. What is sex? Sex is a gift. What is sex? Sex is intimate. What is sex? Sex is productive. Sex is the, is the system that God has created for us as men and women to come together, as man and wa- wife, <laughs> let me be clear, let me cl- be clear about my, my diction. <laughs> as man and wife to come together in marriage to have children, to procreate. So it's God's design for procreation. And I know that we have different issues that we can talk about when we talk about procreation and all of that. I understand all of those, you know, those nuances. But it, it, it is, I find it breaks my heart and it should break the heart of every believer where people have accepted sex for what it is, but have rejected the function of what sex is. So some people want to have sex, but they don't want to procreate. And it's okay if you don't want to procreate and you plan and make sure you don't get pregnant, especially if you're married. But now when you get married or you're not married and you have sex and you, you conceive, then you want to kill the baby. You want to get rid of the baby. Oh, no, 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 I didn't plan for that. Oh, no, you don't get to choose what, you, what comes out of having sex. With the way God designed sex, it leads to procreation. It is that powerful. Oh, no, no, that's part of the, that's part of the plan, baby. What were you thinking? It's, it's part of the package. It's part of the package. It's a gift. And so we got to understand that that's God's design. And in this generation, we are moving away from God's heart concerning everything. We just want to take the pleasure out of everything and leave the responsibility. We just want to sap the the thing that just feeds our flesh and leave the discipline and the and 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 the and the responsibility and the sacrifice and the work of love and the and the tough places. We just want to leave all of that. Just take the two minutes, three minutes here, five minutes for some people an hour, God help you. But you just want to take that. We just want to take those. And live the lifelong responsibility of raising children. And increasing the glory of God in the whole earth. Sex is productive. So for young people, if you're not ready for pro- <laughs> to raise children, please don't have sex. Please don't have sex. Please do not have sex. Because if I find out you have sex, we're going to raise that baby together. I'm going to support you, but you're going to raise that baby. <laughs> uh, don't, think, don't think you're going to come tell me, yeah? Don't think you're going to come tell me, Pastor, you cry, I will give you the biggest hug in the world. I know it's hard, but we're going to raise this child. It is the consequence of an action. You make that decision, you stick with that decision. But let me not go into a different sermon. Let me just talk about sex and what it does. Now, I want to give an illustration. How many of you, you know, you, you know how electricity works, right? And you know that there's a different voltage, right, in your, that runs in your, in your house. But I want you to imagine the power that comes into your house or even the power that feeds the whole community. Right, go grab those wires. They're really the high voltage, 200 volts, 400 volts electrical wires. They're really thick, right? Grab one of them. Go ahead and peel off the wa- the, the rubber cable, uh, the rubber piece around it, and go ahead and hold the copper wire. Hold it and see what's gonna happen to you. What's gonna happen to you? 
You don't want to know. You don't want to know. So electricity is as powerful as that. It can take you off in a minute. Now, I find it interesting that as powerful as electricity is, we all have gotten used to using it. Anybody, has anybody gotten shocked, uh, electrocuted in the past five years, ten years? For some of them, for some people, never. Uh, I don't mean static electricity. I mean real electrocution. <laughs> I don't think any of, of us have been electro electrocuted at least in the past five years. You know why? You have known what, what not to do with electricity. Yeah, yeah. Yes? You know you don't touch electricity when you're wet. Ladies, you're doing your dry, blow drying your hair. You know you stay away from water. You know why? Nobody got to tell you electricity is powerful. Because you get one chance. <laughs> Just one chance. You touch it the wrong way, smokes you. But that's how powerful sex is. That is how powerful sex is. It burns people, it kills people, it destroys families, it can, it can sh shape a whole entire generation. Go read Genesis, an entire, an entire country. All the men were slain because the, 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 Tamar, the, the, the brothers of Tamar, the sons of Jacob, took revenge on men who raped one girl. I mean, it killed a whole. I mean, go read scriptures. Let's even come to our contemporary time. Some men, they've killed other people because they raped their daughters. Let's not act like this is, this is real. This is powerful. Sex can kill. It, it kills. It can kill. So how, how, how do we develop a reverence, an understanding of the power that sex has? Why don't we say, you know what? This thing is so useful and powerful just the way electricity is useful. You can hear me because we have electricity, right, behind all the sound equipment. You can see because we have electricity, but we know how to channel it. We, we keep it where it needs to be. We don't mess with it. Why don't we think about sex like that? That I know this is good and perfect. I know the advantage of it. And I know the only times I can touch this. I know how I can use this. I know, the, I know ways not to touch this. I know if I mess with this like this, it will burn me. Why don't we have the same perspective about sex as powerful as it is? God designed it to be that powerful. You know, when you have sexual arousal and urges, especially for you who are, who are married. I'm, I'm speaking to the people who are married because I don't know that the rest who are not married would know what I'm talking about. I'm open. <laughs> and you are longing for your spouse. So, I mean, sometimes you are, I'm just going to come meet you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to drive to you. It makes you, you're not even thinking right. It's that powerful. You know why? Because there are pathways, neural pathways in your mind that develop once you start having sex. And that feeling is so gratifying and the experience is so gratifying that it will always make you go back to it. And if you're not careful, you can become so addicted to it that it controls your entire life. Now, you got to understand the power. Somebody got to explain to us what sex really is because we, we've been playing around with sex. It's not something you just pick up and put. No, it will burn you. So sex is powerful. And we can talk over and over again about the dangers of sex and the problems that sex is, as people have gotten into because they mishandled and mispracticed sex and all of that. But I just want to paint a picture of some of the benefits that we can get from sex. So I'm going to give you a list of things that sex does for people or people who are married, man and wife, can achieve or can realize when they have sex. Number one, and this is from a health, um, a health outfit that you know, it, I got this online. I don't agree with all the things that are listed. Some of it are, you know, outside of our, so I, 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 I didn't add those. But most of these are health benefits. And so I'm going to list this health benefits for you guys to see. For those of you who are single, I just want you, as I'm listening, I want you to say, oh, so that's the gift I'm going to get. 
oh, so that's what is waiting for me. I, want, <laughs> I don't want you to go looking for it right now. Huh? Number one, sex lowers blood pressure. Lowers blood pressure. So does exercise. Thank you so much. You see how she did that? She said, I'm going to exercise until I get married. Aha! That's good. Thank you so much. Better immune system. Better immune system. Research has found that couples who are married and stay married and engage in healthy sex have less com um, complications, health complications, than, their, than others, other people like the single counterparts or even married counterparts who don't have you know, sex. So it helps with your immune system. It helps with your heart, better heart, lower heart diseases. It, risk, it reduces the risk for heart diseases. It, improve it, it improves self-esteem. It improves self-esteem. Man, in this household, give, make your wife feel like the most beautiful woman that ever lived. When you, when you take her and you guys do whatever you do, I'm trying to make this as PG as possible. I want you to make sure by the time you're done with her or she's done with you, when both of you come out, you just feel like this. You don't even see nobody. You just feel like you, both of you are the only people that ever lived. You have the highest self-esteem. Nobody say nothing to you. I mean, you see her, she looks like, like a queen. And you know why it's critical? It's critical because in this world we live in, there are people, men and women in marriages, who are not satisfied by each other. We're looking everywhere else for affirmation, looking everywhere else for self-esteem because they have not felt the love and the fulfillment that real, true sex ought to bring in a marriage. Why do you think that it was Adam, after Adam saw his wife, he said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You got to make your wife feel like she's flesh of your flesh and bone of your bone. It's critical because we live in a time where self-esteem is eroding fast. And we look and compare ourselves with all the images that flood our eye gates on TV and social media. And everybody's trying to paint a picture that's not accurate of themselves. And we think that's what, that's what love is or that's what self-realization is. And women are so hard trying to look like, like, like Beyonce. I'm just going to mention her name out there. And the guys are out there trying to look at one, like, like one person. Like, come on, guys. When we have, when you have sex in a godly, in the godly system of marriage, both parties ought to grow in self-esteem. Self-esteem. So sex also helps decrease depression and anxiety. Sex can be an immediate, immediate natural painkiller. Somebody say amen. I, I, I meant the married man. <laughs> it's an effective painkiller. When you have sex, the hormones that are released in your body, it just helps soothe your pain. If you're single and you have pain, the Lord is your healer. The Lord is your healer. Jesus is your pain killer. So it's a gift. I'm trying to paint this picture. Maybe, maybe you'll be able to wait long enough to have this perfect gift. If you understand exactly what that gift comp is composed of. Pain killer. Better sleep. Better sleep. You get knocked out. And you just sleep. Incre yeah, these are the benefits, y'all. <laughs> now when you're in the world, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to hide, you're trying to do, you know, you're trying to two time and everything. You, you have sex, you can't even sleep. Because the woman is worried that they're going to be pregnant. The guys are worried that their girlfriends are going to, you know, uh, come on, guys. 
No, no, no. You're not even, you're not even having the full benefits of this package. I mean, when you engage in sex in marriage, you just sleep. You rest. You know why some people say they can't sleep and they're married? Now, y'all should be able to sleep. I know. I didn't warn you guys before. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not playing around with this topic. I ain't playing around with it because I know what it does behind closed doors. We don't want to talk about it, but we talk about it. So let's talk about it openly. Uh huh. Another thing sex does is that it reduces stress overall, both physiologically and emotionally. It helps reduce stress. It boosts our mood. And it's, it helps relieve depression. Sex also just it motivates us and gives us this sense of duty to just please our partner. I made a joke. I'm like, when you have good sex with your spouse, the things that they asked you to do before that you said no, all of a sudden, they're not reminding you. you you're like, I'm going to do this. <laughs> Babe. I'm going to do this. Before you had sex, they said, can you, can you sweep the kitchen area? You said, no, babe. I'm tired. <laughs> you guys have sex? You're like, girl, I'm sweeping the whole house. I'm sweeping the kitchen, the bedroom. What do you want me to do? I'm making dinner. God designed it that way. Because God knows or knew that there are times when Adam don't want to do something. And y'all are laughing. There are times when I just want to chill on the, on the couch. But when, 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 when that happens in the context that God designed it, you, gain, you just gain inspiration. You become very dutiful. Yeah. <laughs> Sex makes babies. That's the, that's the advantage. And it creates fulfillment in seeing what God can do through you. I know just looking at my kids sometimes, I just pause and I'm like, that person came out of me, you know? You know, just, just look at them. That's, that's a part of me, you know? Sex leads to that. Because I don't know how you're going to do that without sex. Oh. <laughs> and I'm trying to make this light as possible. But I want you guys to make sure you're listening to everything I'm saying. Don't get carried away now. Sex helps with product reproduction, procreation to fulfill God's will for mankind. Sex meets mankind's need for affection, wives, give affection to the husband, and husband gives affection to the wife, with the wives. It leads to pleasure. It leads to pleasure. Sex should lead to pleasure, full delight in your spouse. Sex should be a source of delight and fulfillment. Proverbs 5.19, Proverbs 5.19 says this. It says, as a loving deer... And a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. Did we say with their love there? With whose love? Her love. Just one person that will fully captivate you, fully engross you. The only destination in your GPS. It's your spouse. Like you, you have nowhere else to go to. And that's what sex helps us achieve in marriage. Sex also helps reduce sex drive. And sometimes some people like get married, but they just don't, they don't have a healthy communication. And have, they have relationship problems. And so that leads to not having sex. But when they do not have sex, it leads to other problems because there's sex drive that needs to be catered to. And then that leads to people being unfaithful outside of marriage. 
So it is critical that we understand that once you start having healthy sex within the context of marriage, you need to understand that there is a duty to help the other person stay faithful by having sex in marriage. It's the word of God. We're going to see it in scripture. I don't want you to think I'm just, I'm just giving you human knowledge. We're going to find it in scripture. So with all these benefits that we've listed, about all the benefits that we can have with sex, from sex, right? Why do we still have this natural aversion for it sometimes? Sometimes why do we have this unhealthy appetite for it? That means we just use it in a way we do not recognize how powerful it can be. And sometimes we get hurt. Why have we mismanaged it? The problem is not the power of sex. The problem is not the benefits of sex. The problem is the power of sin. And sin is when we do anything outside of the will of God. That's, the, that's a very simple, simplistic definition for sin. That would help you understand that anything you do outside the plan of God, the design of God, the heart of God, you are walking in sin. Sometimes the only time, you know, we, we, we kind of, our minds peak, you know, perk up when we, yes, somebody commit adultery. Oh, oh they sinned. I'm like, you don't even know what sin is. That's just the result of a bigger, deeper issue. And that should be frowned upon, yes. But if you know how you are sinful, sitting down there, <laughs> condemning that person, you, you, it will change your perspective, your whole perspective. And so we, we need to understand that anything we do outside of the confines of how God has designed a thing, it leads to sin. It can be sin. So the problem with sex and the problem with the abuse of sex, it's not that it is not good. It's not that it is not powerful. It's not that it's not useful. It's not that it's, that's not the problem. The problem is sin has overtaken sex. So we got to redefine what sex is. We got to look at it from God's perspective as a beautiful thing that God created. And to say, God, how can you help us use this tool that you have designed to please you? How can we use this, this communion, this fellowship, this, 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 this encounter, this experience? How can, we, how can we do it and please you? If you can ask God, honestly ask God that question and do what God tells you, you won't have a problem with half of what we're talking about. Fornication, adultery, uh, 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 pornography, all of that are just the secondary. The problem is we've not really looked at God and said, God, why, why have you designed this? What did you design this for? How can I use this? And if we do that, I think we'll get closer to God's heart concerning sex. And sexual temptation will be a lot more manageable for a lot of us. Sex is a binding glue. So sex is one. It's a gift. Sex is what? It's intimate. Sex is what? Productive. Sex is what? Powerful. Don't forget those. And sex is a binding glue. It's a binding glue. You don't want to be glued to somebody, don't have sex with them. Because sex glues you both together. Sex creates a soul tie, which is in fact necessary in marriage. I know we look at soul tie always from a negative perspective. Oh, I got a soul tie I want to break. Well, You need to create a soul tie in marriage. Because there are certain difficulties, certain challenges that couples cannot go through if they do not have soul tie. Sometimes counseling wouldn't work. Sometimes information would not work. You know what you need to do, you just ain't doing it. Sometimes everything else would not work. The only thing that works is that you are joined to this person in your soul. And when you don't have healthy soul tie with your spouse, you have head knowledge, but sometimes you slip. You want to love them, but you, I mean, soul tie keeps you tied to them. So sex helps build soul ties. And that's why we have to be careful not to have sex outside of marriage. Because it makes us connected to people who we shouldn't be connected to like that. 
makes us become one with them. Like what Scripture says in the book of Mark 10, Mark, Mark 10, verse 7. It says, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. So there are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. It says, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. They're not two people living together. They are not housemates or roommates. They're not friends with benefits. They're not people who are attracted to each other. They leave everything, and they come together, and they become one flesh. It's okay when I talk to you, you sound like your wife, or I talk to you, you sound like your husband. It's okay. I know something is working right. Because you guys are one flesh. You're beginning to see things alike. I know people say, oh, no, we I want my individuality. This, yes, you, you can have your individuality. But when you, when, you, when you join with somebody and become one flesh, and bone of their bones and flesh of their flesh, there has to be evidence on every level, physiologically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, that you are joined with a person. And that's the advantage and part of the architecture of sex within marriage. 1 Corinthians 6 says this. Verse 16, or perhaps you do not know that the man who joins his body to a prostitute becomes physically connected with her. Physically connected with her. The, sp the scripture says quite plainly, the two will become one body. So sex is a binding glue. And God designed it that way to bind you to that person. So don't think we can have se casual sex and just move on. Don't think you can, you know, no. There's a part of you that is connected to that person forever. There's a part of that person that is connected to you forever. There's a part of their dysfunction, a part of their craziness, a part of their struggles, a part of the things that they deal with that is now joined to you or with you. Sometimes we don't see it, but it manifests later on in life. So why did God create sex to be this powerful? To be this great, powerful, binding glue that glues couples together. It's because it, it helps us, it points us back to God. It's uh, Spiritually, it helps us see God's heart concerning us. How God wants to be one with us. John 14, 20 says this, And on that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I in you. I mean, you see the level of closeness that God is talking about here. God doesn't want to have a people that, he just, that just comes to worship him from a distance. He doesn't just want to have a people who, who are far away and just acknowledge God with a wave. He wants people that he can live in them, and they in him, and he can say we are inseparable. We are so connected. And if you understand sex in the right context, and you meditate upon what it does to you physiologically, mentally, spiritually, you can begin to understand the union that God craves with us. To be one with him. To be connected with him. That is one reason God has created sex. And that's one thing that we can glean from when we think about sex. And for those of us who are still single right now, for some of us, not in, out of any fault of our own, we're single maybe because we lost our partner or we divorced or something like that. I want you to understand, go back and think about those precious times and, and the feeling of sex and the satisfaction and the closeness and the oneness. I want you to understand that that is the, the same way God wants you to be one with him. And that would keep you all busy, young single people. <laughs> keep you all busy for a little bit. Sex builds mutual submission. Mutual submission. The gift of sex was not created for one party alone. It wasn't created for the man alone. I've heard the saying, we live in a man's world. No, that's not true. Live in a world of men and women. 
sex wasn't created for one party. It wasn't created for just satisfying our pleasure. We're not just supposed to harvest the pleasure out of sex and leave all of the responsibilities and all of the things that come with it. I like what 1 Corinthians 7 says, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 3. It says the husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs. I like the way he opens up with a husband. Praise God. The husband should satisfy the wife's sexual needs. So for married men and women here, husbands, if your wife needs a foot rub, you give her a foot rub. Women, if your husband needs a neck rub, you give him a neck rub. Don't say, oh, I, I don't like doing that. And they, they, no, that's what they want. That's what you do. You're not doing it because you like to do it. You're not doing it because you enjoy to do it. You better, grow, you better enjoy doing it because you're going to be miserable because you got to do it. And yet people, I don't like doing that. I say, you better, you better watch what you like or don't like. You better have an open mind <laughs> before you get into marriage. Because you got to be mutually submissive to one another. Husbands, fulfill the needs of your wives. Wives, fulfill the needs of your husbands. Scripture says that the wife gives authority over her body to her husband. And I've heard this preached and people stop here and talk about how the woman should be submissive to the husband. Well, it says just after that. And husband gives authority over his body to his wife. She says, if she says, <laughs> if she says she wants a shaved head, you you give her a shaved head. <laughs> she says she wants you ripped up, all looking all buffy. You go to the gym and you work out. <laughs> all right, you guys are not you're not understanding this. And y'all single, nobody better be telling you what they want about you and they're not married to you. No better, nobody better be telling you, nobody got no authority over you. Nobody, be, nobody better be defining how you appear, what you sound like. If they want to do that, let them maintain marriage. And we can start talking about mutual submission. Do not submit to anybody who is not married to you. Like that, sexually, like that, sexually. <laughs> Scripture says in verse 5, do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so that you can give yourselves more completely to prayer and afterward you should come together again so that Satan would not be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But what does this teach us? Mutual submission. Being there to serve our spouse. Helping them achieve sexual fulfillment. How does that, what else does that do for us? That helps us understand the, 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 the desire of submission that God wants us to have with him. That level of submission. If you're really faithful to your spouse and you really meet your spouse's needs, you go understand what God is talking about, about being submissive to him. Because there's times when you don't want to eat something and you eat it because they want to eat it. I know you all are not that submissive in this world. You know why we're not that submissive? Partly because we've got too many resources. Like, you, you buy your own thing, I buy my own thing. You do your own thing, I do my own thing. I'm like, no. You, wanna, you want us to do that? We're going to do that today. I don't enjoy eating tacos, but I'll eat tacos for you. Can somebody be that submissive? No, because in this generation, we want what we want. When we want it, how we want it. No more sacrifice. Oh, there's nothing wrong. You can order your own food. No, no. I want us to eat this today. I know that's crazy. Let me, that's not part of the message. Some like, that's a little too much. <laughs> but that's part of how I learned submission. I'm just going to be like, you know what? I don't, it's not my thing. But 
you want to do it, I'll do it. For you, I'll do it. For you, I'll go. For you, we'll eat it. We'll start it for you. I'll do it. But some of us would not say, no, 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 we're going to meet. I'm going to go here, you're going to go there, we're going to meet. No. Learn mutual submission. Mutual submission. So this teaches us how to be submissive to God, God's nature and Jesus Christ's nature. I want to I want to point us to scripture, what scripture says in the book of Psalms 42, verse 1. Scripture says that I said, dear pants for the streams of water. So my soul longs after you. Oh God, my soul thirsts for God, the living God. When shall I come and appear in God's presence? Oh my God. David, well, that's why he had problems with women, by the way. <laughs> it's just too passionate. It's too passionate. <laughs> but I find men in this generation, no passion at all. No passion. We're worshiping God. Uh, yeah. Where your passion at? Can you, can you say, God, my soul longs after you? The women don't know this, but the men know what I'm talking about. When, you, when you're longing for your wife, when you're longing for your spouse, you know how it feels, right? Can you, do you long after God? In, in, not in that way. We have to be careful how I phrase this. Because sometimes people's minds are all crazy. But that level of passion, desire for God, it's lacking in this generation. David says, my soul longs for you. When you have sex in the right context, and you understand what it does to your mind, to your body, you can begin to feel, you can resonate, and you can see how you long for God's presence. It also points us back to how God desires us in relationship. That communion, that connectivity with God is something that is lacking in this generation, and God wants to restore that. God's want to re God wants to re-engage our minds. Singles, young people, you can still seek after God like this. You can seek after God with this reckless abandonment. Like, God, my soul longs for you. I desire to know you. I just, I just love God crazy, crazy, you know. You can't even talk when you talk about God because I know it's not in this generation anymore. We have so many things that meet our appetites. We have so many places that we go to satisfy our longings. The phone, you, you, you feel some sort of way, you just go into private, you pick up your, mov your mobile uh, phone or whatever, and you meet that need. You lose all the passion that should be conserved for God. You feel a sort of way, you just go to the corner, you do whatever you do, you come back out. You, can't, you cannot sit in this place where you feel the passion in your bones and you're just like, God, I'm going to pour this out before you. Lord, there's this longing in me. There's this struggle in me. There's this, I'm going to pour it out before you, Jesus. We sang beautifully earlier on. How are we going to pour out our soul before God? But we need to learn in this generation how to really how to serve God with our entire being. But within the context of sex, God uses this to create fulfillment, productivity, delight within marriage. 